you guys got drinks, by the way? Mm-hmm. No. I have some water. Do you want to be drinking? Well, do you want to? Grab a water or something like that, just for your throat, just in case. If you want to, if you're not, if oh, you're I comfortable. Th- I thought you meant mi- whiskey. <laughs> no. Hold on. Are you heading for the stereotypes? You got Shrek, and we've got whiskey <laughs> within the close. Well, it sounds like you're from the UK <laughs> or Scotland. You're Scottish. I'm right? from Scot. I'm Scottish. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. I'll be right back. That's all right. <sighs> <sighs> My word. <laughs> Don't meet your heroes, they said. <laughs> Gavin's a good man. <clears throat> Don't meet your heroes. He just disappointed me in the first kind of thirty seconds. You know, Shrek. <laughs> you compared you to Shrek. I don't know. And compared me to Shrek, and then talked about whiskey and uh-huh. you know. Yeah. But you sound like a decent man. <laughs> but you can be my new. I'll be your new. I'll you be your be new friend. My, you can be my new hero. <laughs> Perfect, Gavin. Get out of here. Get go, I, you know. Oh, I'm back. Were, we weren't were you guys ta- talking about me. No, we were. We were not talking about me being the new hero. You're. You're. Yeah. You're out. <laughs> I'm just, you know, just a bit cut up about the whole Scottish <laughs> stereotype thing. You know, I had haggis for dinner. I mean, I don't know what I'm talking. I'm wearing a kilt. <laughs> you know, you're lucky the camera's not on. You get an extra view. Um. Okay, let's. I'm just going to jump you, in and You kind of look like Willie from uh, The Simpsons. Watch it. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Hello, and welcome to another episode of We Are Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for August. Um, some people, this, it's like, was it Ron Burgundy said, you sit on a throne of lies? And some people sit on a throne of dice. Mm-hmm. In fact, some people have taken their throne of dice and they've made almost like an entire series of games about it. And so when you get into a series of games about it, then there's only one thing that you can do. You really need to reach out and see if you can speak to these people who have turned their their di- turned their, their throne of dice into a dice throw, made it into a series, made it successful, get it on Kickstarter. It's, the, it's exciting. I have got one of my heroes, Mr. Manny Tremblay, <laughs> and I've got some other guy with him <laughs> who hangs about Ooh. with him a lot and tries to clean <laughs> all the glory. It's, it's Gavin Brown <laughs> from Roxley Chickeny Games type thing. I don't know. We can The real we'll hero. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway, I'm not apologizing for that intro after what's said. I mean I'm still kinda I'm stuck in a heart. You know, I'm just, I'm just feeling the first thing was a paper cut and the second thing was a lovely bit of lemon juice. So you can't have it all. So, so there you go. And then so, after shave. <laughs> and then after shave, it's like Kevin and Home Alone, mm. and I can't believe they're remaking that. But there you go. Anyway, how are you doing, gentlemen? Are you doing well? Great. Yeah, I'm doing great. Yeah. How are you doing, man? Yeah, this is uh, it's incredible. We're coming into the end of our campaign, and it is uh, it's exhausting, but it's epic. Yes. Yeah, um, it's kind of because you're out. I'm checking, and in pounds, that's UK British pounds. You're at like one point two million, which in dollary dues mm-hmm. is one and a half million. Yep. And in Canadian dollars, over two million. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm Canadian, so we were just having me and Manny were just having a discussion that I get to say. We made over two million, <laughs> yeah. and he only gets to say that we made over one point. I'm going to pretend I'm Canadian though, and I'm going to tell all my friends we made two million. I think I think you're entitled to do that, seeing as you're my new hero. Yeah. <laughs> um. So there you go. Um. But mood in camp must be. Are you kind of? Is this is the last kind of thirty hours? So normally, what's happened is you know, eighteen hours ago, the the kind of the emails have gone out to all the people who liked and favorited kind of like the project. So is this kind of all is this kind of all hands on deck, kind of red alert, kind of battle stations, Gavin, for yourselves at the moment? For this last kind of push? Yes. Um we're definitely I mean, this is now what our fifth or sixth campaign. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit less of a you know, DOS boot situation mm-hmm. than than it normally would be. Um, and now we have more support with uh, 
Paul Saxberg and Adam Wise and uh, Kira Peevely helps yes. us on a daily basis. So we're trying to be organized and um, be less, you know, make it easier on everybody's lives. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, when, even when we're running Kickstarter campaigns, because ideally, you know, we're trying to make this a career and trying to integrate Kickstarter um, in a sort of feasible way for in the long term of our business right so we're doing whatever we can to to not you know overstep bounds on on anybody's personal lives too much but still i mean paul might you know we're working all every night every day yeah yeah kind of thing so that's just part of deadlines but there's nothing like that feels um (laughs) you know, out of control at the moment, which is nice. Yep. Like right now I'm actually drawing a piece of art while we're talking. <laughs> well, that's yeah, fine because, work- you know, you're doing heroic work there, <laughs> Manny, so I didn't expect to. You're, you're a multitasker. Yes. That's what, that's what it's like. It's true, it's true. <laughs> People are going to want to know what the hell's going on in the background and why this is all turned about. And you know what? I'm not going to tell them. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it as a, I'm going to leave it as a mystery. Um, for yourself, Gavin, when <clears throat> was this a planned kind of journey for you? Or were you, when you first kind of started off with things like, you know, one of my favorite games, Steampunk Rally, um, was it just, was it the hobby time at the time or had you already kind of planned out? Because Roxley Games itself has has managed to hit some serious well-known games in its kind of campaigns and things like that so far. Santorini, which was like, basically it was a tabletop darling for goodness knows how long. You've got kind of brass there as well. You've got obviously dice thrown. Are you kind of sitting there going, this is, this actually maybe in some ways couldn't have gone any better the last kind of four or five years for yourself? Um... Yeah, in in many ways, I feel I basically always just kind of feel fortunate Mm -hmm. um, that I get to work with such talented people, and um, you know, I'm I'm so obsessive, I guess, and Mm -hmm. that's kind of like my my curse and my you know my superpower at the same time. Yeah. Uh, So all these games, you know, all these games the covers and all the details and, and even the gameplay, you know, they, they just go through the ringer and our objective is to really make games that fire on all cylinders. Mm-hmm. So um, I do feel, uh, f- you know, fortunate that obviously we have had the success that we've had in, in the last couple of years. Yes. And like, I, I sometimes a lot of the time, you know, you work on a project so long and you're like, is this even good? I Like, I can't even tell anymore. Yeah. It just seems like garbage now to me. And then, you know, when you get the objective opinion of the market and they say how much they love it, you're like, oh, you know, it is, it is good. And, you know, I, it's just, it, I've just been staring at it so long that I've forgotten how good it is. Yeah. Um, with D- Dice Throne is different for me though, be- like yeah. because I feel like Dice Throne was something that was brought to me, um, and I, you know, we we signed it. Uh, I I actually signed it because of how passionate Nate and Manny are, yeah. not and and how highly other people had talked about the game. I hadn't I hadn't really realized at the time that we signed it just how good the game was <laughs> and we and i i just knew that i wanted to work with guys uh that are people that are as passionate as nate and manny um but then i started playing it with my kids and uh, you know i think it's the our most absolutely by far the most played game in our household you know we played i played well over 200 games with my kids so mm-hmm. You know, and to, to this day, it's one of my favorite games of all time. So I feel super fortunate to, to you know, be involved in the project. Um, Manny, did you did you pitch Dice Throne to a lot of people before it landed in on kind of Gavin's desk? No, <clears throat> no, we did not actually. We pitched. We talked with one other publisher, beef, mm-hmm. and uh. And then we talked with Gavin, and meeting Gavin actually the first time was kind of unique. It was uh, Nate and Gavin were on a Facebook community group page talking about games, and they both right. they both 
had similar opinions on some random post. I don't even remember what it was. Maybe Gavin does, but they uh, then then they ended up chatting in private message. And at the time, Nate and I were wondering, can we actually do we have the capacity to take Dice Throne where it needs to go? Um, can the mm-hmm. two of us? Uh, Nate runs his own company. He's he's a busy busy man, and yeah. so we we're like, well, if we were going to partner with anybody. We would want to partner with someone like Roxley because we looked at their games, we looked at what they did, and we're like, we. I mean, even before we ever really sat down and talked, we we wondered, you know, is this a guy who would be willing to work with us and willing to take on Dice Throne? So, yeah, um, I mean, it's kind of like the div- it's the diverse catalog that kind of Roxley has, mm-hmm. and that's kind of continued as as kind of. As kind of as I say, as kind of time time goes on. I mean, I forgot. I'll be honest. I perf- I totally forgot that you guys had you know you'd been responsible for brass, and it's like, well, that's the kind of the 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 diverse kind of nature of the kind of the the catalog that you're that you're running with. Um, would you have taken it to Kickstarter yourself then, Manny? If if you know, did you were you or would you think, well, this is my limitations. If I if I don't. If I end up taking it to Kickstarter myself, I might not end up with a product it deserves to be. It doesn't, you know, it'll it'll be the caterpillar instead of being the butterfly kind of Oh, thing. sure. We we actually launched the Kickstarter, the first one ourselves. So Dice Throne Season mm-hmm. 1 was just us, Nate and I. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so we uh, we did all the fulfillment, all the distribution. We, worked, we got our arrangement with uh, PSI for consolidation distribution across the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, manufacturing Mm -hmm. we handled it handled it all but part of the realization there is that's a lot of work it's a lot of labor yeah and we just we felt like as we continue to grow we're gonna need help we we need we need someone to help us on this path so with the second one obviously once we partnered with roxley um it was a no-brainer that roxley would run the second kickstarter for season two Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um do you think that Gavin? Do you think that your track record then kind of help propel kind of Dice Throne? You know, anyway, you know, it was already kind of it had a name to it. Do you reckon that that your kind of back catalogue and again, your Santorini's, your steampunk rallies that kind of help kind of push it even further than where it might have possibly gone anyway? I I like to think that um, I mean the the reason why I'm so obsessive and so picky with games is is because i want um you know our our ultimate objective is for people to when they go into a store and they see roxley on the box you know they they pick it up and they look at it it the theme looks cool to them they read the back the gameplay sounds interesting to them and then Mm -hmm. they go buy it they don't have to go on to board game geek and who you know what's the average rating I yeah. want people to just look, you know, see that a game is a Roxley game and say, I'm going to just buy that game. So I would like to think that um, that that my level of obsession and and my my threshold for quality um, has helped, I guess, any game that we bring to market. Um that's that's sort of the intention. Yeah, I so. I can state unequivocally that Roxley's involvement has been a major catalyst in the growth of Dice Throne. Like I I mean Nate and I we we set out, we made our game, we published it, we did a Kickstarter. It was successful, we delivered mm-hmm. on time. We did everything you should mm-hmm. do and we were ready to launch a second one ourselves. And when we partnered, there's there's definitely us wanting to like, we partnered with this group A because Gavin's awesome. Um, and definitely worth being a hero, I might add. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. But I, <laughs> the uh, like, it's interesting because you look at season one. Like, I did all the graphic design for season one, and I am not a graphic designer by nature. Like, I can do the work. But I'm an illustrator. And when Gavin came in, he he and Roxley elevated our product to the next level. Uh, up to the graphic design, the box, the trays, all the components, all the, the the presentation that that wow factor when people look at it on a shelf, they look at it everywhere. So I think one hundred percent Gavin and Roxley's influence in Dice Throne is a major catalyst to why we're sitting at one point five million on our third Kickstarter. 
the thing, I guess, when you get that kind of level, um, are you, I, I mean, are you, Gavin, are you starting to think things along the lines of a CEO? I mean, are you starting to break away from the, I'm doing this, I need to think more like how we're doing this business infrastructure and things like that and bringing other people on and you can't, you know, the the realisation you can't just do everything in yourself. Are you having to think more in terms of this is, this is a, you know, proper, you know, not, a, you know what I mean, not, not, not trying to talk, but like a real business there's going to be, we're going to have to, I'm going to have to think about resources. I'm going to have to think about management. I can't just say, I really love playing games. I really love designing games. I'm just putting games on kind of Kickstarter. Have you had to try and change your, your kind of your focus in the way, the way that you're looking at things? I mean, uh, I'm trying my best not to <laughs> yeah. change. Um, I'm doing, and I think I, I'm doing more than what other business owners like I'm sorry, I think I'm doing more to try to maintain the roots than a lot of business owners even want to. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm still doing a lot, you know, almost all the graphic design with the help of Guy now, who does a lot of the layout. Yeah, uh, Guy is in Brazil, um, and the branding. And yes, it's a lot of the time it's more more than I can handle. And so some, a lot of the time I'm the bottleneck. No, so, right, okay. you know, I, it's almost, and, but I don't want like a, the objective for me in with Roxley was to have an outlet to make games, um, make good games. And so I'm going to do whatever I can to, to maintain that. I don't, I don't want to be a huge company, um, which is strange in this capitalist sort of society we live in but i want to be a small little team of uh of passionate people and i want to make i want to make games and i want to make very good games um yeah so i'm doing but it's what you're saying is true it's it's unavoidable yeah um but i have been lucky enough to be able to hire people to help me and actually kind of boss me around to be honest um um, so Paul and Adam and Max is a uh, he ra- he ran a or runs a little publishing company called Stratamax Games. Yeah, and uh, he's kind of the gray hair of the group, and he he kind of keeps me um, under control and in line and thinking about timelines because um, I'm absolutely not the best guy for timelines. I can drive a single project to completion, and I can also you know, if I, if given enough time, I would just develop something endlessly forever. Mm-hmm. So I need somebody to kind of crack the whip for me. Um, and Nate in, in terms of dice throne, Nate is very much that, that person, uh, that keeps, keeps us all me and Manny, both as artists, we tend to just refine and redo and, and just be creative or want to be creative. And Nate is the, the guy that's saying, okay, let's get on with it. Cause we, yeah. this is the dates and these are when we need to get things done. But obviously, you know, I do do a lot, like I, I do a lot of negotiating and lots of trying to, you know, making, you know, capitalizing on opportunities and yeah. overseeing staff. I mean, this is all unavoidable parts of business, uh, thinking about finance and budgeting. Um, yeah. So, Definitely, my role has changed more and more, but I've been lucky enough to still main, be able to maintain my ability to oversee the branding and do most of the branding work, um, as as well as you know all the graphic design and you know a lot of development as well. Has it um has it so, given you a bit more yeah. freedom to maybe take some risks in some future projects to maybe look at? I mean, I. I uh, am I get am I am I right in saying that you're um has it allowed you to to consider kind of like taking more risks when you're looking at kind of uh, more IPs? I'm because I'm guessing are you are you starting are you starting to get pitched quite a bit? Then I mean, are people kind of are, do, you, do you have to sift through emails on a daily basis, Gavin, with people saying oh, I've got this brilliant idea? It's just like Santorini, except it's in Egypt, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, we do get a lot of pitches via email. Um, hmm. 
we we basically say no to almost everything um Mm -hmm. we have actually signed a couple um one that we're gonna probably announce here soon that manny actually did the art for and all right okay cool um and the game is quite good um so we do get pitches basically we say look if it's on tabletop simulator yeah. And you can pitch us the game because we can like review it quickly. They can explain it in live yeah, in person yeah. and we can play test it all within an hour kind of thing. So, you know, we do get a lot of, a lot of pitches, but mostly they're, they're weeded out, uh, through email by Paul. All right. Okay. What about yourself, Manny? I mean, I mean, obviously dice thrown is going to be a huge thing that, um, you're going to be involved in. But at the same time, are you allowing yourself to look at other designs, other kind of games? Have you still got the kind of the A4 kind of notepad full of game ideas that you'd like to get to the table? Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, I have uh, two games that I co-created with my friend Aaron, and we we mm-hmm. had those. T- two of them picked up by a publisher. They haven't announced it yet. Mm-hmm. And not Roxley. Uh, but they picked up two two games. Um, and then I'm also mm-hmm. working on a game, uh, doing the art for a game for Skybound called Wonderland's War. And so I have... Oh, yeah, I've heard, of, yep. yeah, I heard yep. about that. <laughs> so I'm doing the art and graphic design stuff, or, well, first pass on graphic design uh, uh-huh. for that game. And then I've also, they've been nice enough to let me join their game design and development. So I get to go down i travel down to la and i've been able to meet with them and play the game and offer feedback and make suggestions and stuff and they've been very gracious to listen to me and take my feedback and um i've gotten to see some of it implemented into the game which is super cool but uh yeah it's really neat we're that that game's supposed to come to kickstarter in october i think is the plan I think so. I mean, to tell the truth, I mean, I, I had James Hudson on the show um, a couple of years ago, and he had mentioned the kind of the the, the Alice in Wonderland game kind of back there, and mm-hmm. then I think uh, Guardians Call and everything like that kind of happened. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking at the time he was just, you know. <laughs> We had a kind of a jokey conversation. I thought he was just like kind of saying, I'm just going to tell you any name at all. And it's like, all right. And then this game never appeared. <laughs> and then all of yes. a sudden, the last kind of six months is kind of is kind of rocked out because he moved. Obviously, he's working full. He's, in with, he's full time as Skybound, isn't he? Now? He is there, yeah. Um, game, him, head of game development there, yeah. Yeah. Him and uh, is it Derek Funkhauser? I think he's yep, joined yes. the team quite recently yes. as well. So, yep. Um, Derek will be. I think Derek will might be paying us another visit himself kind of soon. So you got? Have you got the ability to kind of go and do whatever you kind of want then? Um, as well, it sounds like you're not kind of completely a hundred percent exclusive with with Rockley then. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Dice Throne is probably the thing that occupies a majority of my time. I mean, the truth is, when I mm-hmm. when I started working with Skybound, my first statement to James was, "Hey, as long as you're cool with me taking as much time as I need to make the art, I'm happy to I'm happy <laughs> to do it." Because I, I he yeah. knows Dice Throne is my baby. This is this is my yeah. project. You know, I love Wonderland's War. It's a great game, and I love making the art. But Dice Throne is my that, that that's my game. So I'm gonna make sure that Dice Throne gets gets first pick of my time and my energy. Are you are you both working on projects? Have you got other projects together that you're going to be working on then, Gavin? I mean, I uh, take it you're not just letting him go anywhere he wants. I mean, I yeah, take... we've I mean we've talked about collaborating on several projects actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I like I got into this whole thing because I want to be a game designer, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> like for ten years I designed games before I even started Broxley, so you know i want to eventually be able to you know release some of my own designs and collaborate with somebody like manny to to make something super cool so there's several that we've that we've talked about yeah do you miss being just kind of designing away and being able to kind of do what you want gavin absolutely (laughs) yes like every everything comes at a cost right so yeah everybody you know i meet you meet 
I mean, a lot like, you know, I'm, I'm one of the founders of Game Artisans of Canada, which is like a, an organization of, of Canadian game designers um, that we established in 2008. And back mm-hmm. then there was no Facebook groups or no, you know, there was nothing really. Designers would design in a box and we created this organization and, and it really helped us everybody it, we had a forum and everything where we talked about game design and it was just revolutionary for me mm-hmm. um but back then and from then till now it's or sorry from then until i started roxley it was just kind of me up all like i, I have hundreds of google docs with with uh you know game design game design documents um and all these prototypes like I have a I have a game called Hooch, which is a heavy economic game. I guess kind of like yeah. grass. Yeah. Um, that's I, I like if I look at that folder and how much gra- how many graphics are in it. <laughs> there's hundreds of hours of of just dis- like visual graphic design that I put in. Let alone all the there's like 18 versions of the design document for it, and I've made probably about eight physical prototypes of it, and you know spent two years on it <laughs> so <laughs> and it, it never got published you know because when roxley started you know there's a, I, you know it's kind of like there's a difference between your calling and your dream right and my dream is to be a game designer and i still get to design obviously and and develop um yeah but if my eventually you know like i kind of envy jamie stegmeyer um in that he has the mental fortitude and the time to be able to continue, you know, being the main designer of it in his company. Right. So, yeah. It, so, but uh, my calling is definitely being a, like, I'm really, I never wanted to actually be a game publisher. It's just, <laughs> I realized that, that no one like back, you know, back when I was getting into game design, no one was, doing what i felt was a really a good job there's very few that i felt were doing an actually a good job of 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 publishing games um and so i was like i i if i'm gonna make i'm gonna make my own games but i'm also gonna publish them too because i was doing i was doing board game art i did eminent domains art with, with tmg and uh so i i had gone i'd done everything in the the process of publishing games except writing the check to the manufacturer basically so you know i was kind of like i need to just do this myself and then i'll you know make i'll just make my own games and and then you realize how much work it is to publish a game and the last thing on the list is always designing your next game so then it's like oh well you know, I can design the, you know, I can keep working on a design, but I don't know when it's going to be finished. Maybe never Mm because game design is very random and you don't, it's very difficult to, to know when something is going to be, be finished when you start it. But I have all these awesome games presented to me and in front of me. So I'm like, let's just publish these instead um, of me just because I don't want it to be a vanity press, right? It's not about me. It's about making the best game. And until I can make it the best game for us to publish, I'm not going to publish it. So, would yeah. you like to do what Jamie does and kind of move away from Kickstarter? I mean, you're now in the million dollar club. I mean, your your guys are there. You know, it's kind of like it's, it. It must be really difficult to think. Well, you know, we could probably if we put up a kind of another strong kind of game under the Dice Throne brand, we're probably definitely going to hit another million. But there's the unknown, kind of, the distribution side of things as well. So would you would you ever move away from Kickstarter, do you think? Could you? I, 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 I actually, so probably last year I was really contemplating this. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and But I've really been... Um, I, it's been my mission for a long time to see because Kickstarter is a very volatile environment. Yeah. Um, you, you, there's, it's easy to, you know, do something wrongfully and, you know, even if you don't mean to, that, you know, really upsets the community. And a lot of the time they're right. Um, yes. It, but you just, you had, there's no way to have known from your perspective that what you were doing was wrong or incorrect. Um, 
And so obviously this is that volatility is, I, I believe, part of, you know, what, what drove Jamie to kind of quit using Kickstarter. Um, but it's been my objective for a long time to sort of see if we can overcome that and figure out if there's a way for a company to use Kickstarter um, long term as a part of like the, their business model. Um, so we don't do very many Kickstarters. Um, the latest thing that we've done, obviously, in the last two ki- Kickstarter campaigns, um, and in one of my theories, it's been one of my theories for a long time, is uh, stretch goals uh, create just create more volatility in a campaign. Um, you know, and they create uh, expectations that the creator can't necessarily um, live up to. Um, yes, and they create they create they can create disappointment in the community and animosity. Um, if, if the community feels that, you know, what the stretch goals are aren't good enough or whatever. So the la the iron, with the iron clays campaign that we did, you know, that we just finished last month or well, the month before, I don't know, it's all blur because we're so busy, <laughs> but when we finished the iron clays campaign, um, or sorry, when we ran the iron clays campaign, I was like, they, they were, I was like, I'm not doing stretch goals. I'm, I'm just going to try it. Yeah, yeah, and I, and right before, like when I click that launch button, I'm like, "This is gonna fail. We have no stretch goals. This is gonna fail. This is gonna fail." Mm-hmm. But I needed to. I just needed to know. I just needed to know. Can we succeed with no stretch goals? And <laughs> I mean, obviously, the the campaign just blew my expectations completely out of the water. I had no yeah. idea that it would do that well. No clue that it would have done that well. And so. And, and people were happy. They were happy without the stretch goals. And we managed to create engagement without stretch goals. And so, you know, did we leave, are we leaving money on the, and so we did the same thing with the Dice Throne Adventures campaign. Um, because I, I believe that it is that our mental sanity and our, our sort of enjoyment of our job uh, and, you know, reducing the stress is important to making Kickstarter uh, feasible for the long term of the company. Yeah, I also my my concern over stretch goals as well as the smaller guys, because sometimes they're just happy to be funded and getting their stuff out there, and there seems to be a bit of a pressure to have kind of multiple stretch goals as well. I mean, I mean yourself, Manny. I mean, how do you? What do you think about the stretch goal situation? Looking at it from somebody who's got you know you've got your baby there and you want to look after it. I mean, would you prefer that people had the ha- were able to get their hands on the entire thing, and you weren't kind of ending up having to kind of hold stuff back? I guess. I think there's I think there's value in stretch goals, and I, I would actually say that the smaller the publisher is, or the the newer they are to Kickstarter, the more that mm. you can actually use stretch goals to your advantage, because. If you were small, like our first campaign, we didn't know if we would raise 15000 30000 100000 We had no idea. So we set our bar really, really low for manufacturing on the off chance or on the chance that we we only had 500 backers or 1,000 backers and we only made $40,000. So we knew going in that we need to be prepared to make a minimum viable product. And if we can't produce yeah. that minimal viable product, then we shouldn't be on Kickstarter at all. But then we use stretch goals to enhance the game. And we genuinely made the game better because the people were there. They, they, they paid for it. They wanted it. They, they supported our yeah, game. Yeah. And we were able to increase the, the, the hero count. We were able to do a number of things. So when you're a small publisher, an indie publisher like that, if you're if you're genuinely using stretch goals to make the product the way you really want to make it, then I think that there's validity to it. But I think if you're a major publisher, like the Dice Throne Season 2 box is an incredibly produced box, so incredibly high quality. And yeah. So I'm not I'm not sure what you would do. Like if we started out the campaign with like, well guys, we're gonna dumb all the content down to nothing. We want to make sure we can have stretch goals. So let's stretch goal to linen finish on bo- in the box. And you know, that's silly. That's just a that's just a silly business model at that point. And I feel like if we came out the gate with a 
crappier version of Dice Throne Adventure because we wanted to pretend to stretch goal to get a better box and some vacuum trays that, that that felt in disingenuous. And I think so for our situation coming out the gate and saying, listen, here it is guys. This is what we, this is the game that we want. We want to play it. We want you to play it. Yeah. You know, enjoy, enjoy it. And we didn't set a precedent, but Kickstarter is so has trained people and it's Kickstarter's fault and it's publisher's fault. But backers have become so incredibly taught to even when you tell them, nah, man, there's nothing else coming. They think that you're giving them a wink and a nudge and you, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, nothing else is coming. Right. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We look, we (laughs) we look forward to this. Nothing else. (laughs) Eh, What are you going to show us? The update numbers and nothing? No, no. And and then they're mad. Then they get mad. They're like, what's this garbage? You you give us nothing. We're like, we told you we're giving you nothing. And they're like, all right, nothing you say. Right, right, right. The next update, nothing's coming. Ha ha ha. <laughs> I just, yeah, I think it's um I think as Kickstarter on the video game side seems to be shrinking, whereas Kickstarter on the board game side continues to be kind of steady as she goes kind mm-hmm. of thing. But I think you're starting to see as the hobby hobbies kind of collide slightly on the Venn diagram. Mm-hmm. I think you start to see people who are, or your board gamers are well aware of what's happening in the video game market and how they seem to be carving off kind of chunks of their game and then offering it as, here's cosmetic DLC you can buy. And my concern about a lot of Kickstarters is uh, there was two. One of them is, like you say, you know, if you're kind of, if you're a smaller publisher and you're like saying, well, you know, it's going to cost us, you know, $9 a box on the plain finish, but I can get a linen finish and that's going to cost us nine fifty a box, but we have to have a stretch goal for that. I think that's kind of a maybe a valid thing if they're just really, really joyous that their game's getting funded. I think my my issue with maybe some of the big publishers is when I see kind of stretch goals which are bringing in additional components sometimes, mm-hmm. like games that I know that it's been obviously carved off and there's a couple of companies out there that have done it. And I'm also not sure about kind of stretch goals offering optional purchases as well. Because right. yeah. I think that can drive up the overall ticket on a game. I mean, I'm looking at some of the games out there. And in order to get everything in the package, it's like lining up to be two, three hundred dollars, which is fine because they're getting it because they're getting a whack of cash. But also at the same time, there's a lot of people that. I, I worry about some people's financial situation when they're laying down two hundred and fifty dollars at a time on a Kickstarter. When I remember, you know, when I mean, I'm not going to keep going back to the halcyon glory days of the translucent yellow, red, and blue dice of Steampunk Rally. Mm. But when that came out, you know, you didn't get many over the hundred dollar mark in terms of the Kickstarters. It was generally. You know, it's like I sound like an old man when this was nothing but fields, you know, and it used to sun, <laughs> it used to be sunshine every day. But you didn't get a massive amount of, you didn't get an awful lot of campaigns over that were hitting the $100 mark for the base game and then adding on a pile of stuff on top so that you were ending up with a total ticket of two, dollars $300. And I think we seem to see that kind of an awful lot. And I, I worry about what kind of precedent that is setting for kind of people. Uh, um, it just kind of slightly, slightly concerned. Well, during during this uh, campaign, there were five <laughs> blockbuster kickstarters with over a million dollars cur- concurrently running yeah. for yeah. board games. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen that in my life. Like so, you know, there's there's only so. It's like the competition is increasing at a greater rate than new people are entering the system right so then you know you so you know maybe i'm naive to say we don't want to play the game you know um but we we don't really want to play the game at least i don't anymore i want to i want to just make good games and i don't want to try to employ all these like tactics and mm. trickery to 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 maximize every ounce of profit like i heard uh, you know some uh, i was listening to um an audiobook about you know the inception of pixar 
They were saying, uh, the, the guy who wrote the book, he was saying that, you know, Walt Disney's, um, Walt Disney always said, we make movies, uh, we don't make movies so that we can make money, we make money so that we can make movies. And that's kind of how I feel as a creator. Like, mm. I want to keep making enough money so that we can do this, you know, for a living as a career. And that's it. Yep. Look, I'm just jealous because I'd love to drop three hundred dollars on a Kickstarter campaign, and I just ain't got three hundred dollars. Otherwise, I'll be up to my eyeballs in minis. You know what I mean? I'd be. <laughs> I just feel like throwing minis about, wearing kind of minis chains. You know, my car, the car bonnet. You know, the inside bit of my car would just be have little kind of minis all over <laughs> the place. I'd have like the Cthulhu. The Cthulhu Mini, that it's not a Mini, it's a Maxi. That would be on my like the, the bonnet of my car, like some kind of Rolls Royce kind of wing <laughs> thing. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. The you know, I'm not talking words. about. I'm not concerned. I'm just absolutely jealous. Let's get this right. You know, but from, I mean, okay, Manny, yeah. here's a question for you. As somebody who's running, and and this is obviously time's ticking, and this is coming to its end as somebody who's about to lay down you know potentially it could work reach you know 1750 in terms of millions of dollars mm -hmm. do you think there should be a separate pen for the people who are starting out do you think that your big your big boys of this world should have their own section in kickstarter or and then the indie guys and you guys should have their own section or do you think that you know, it's fine as it is, and then it's down to the individuals kind of doing their marketing to get themselves kind of noticed. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of discussion about stuff like that, whether it's different places people can go. Like, uh, I know there's been a couple of companies mm -hmm. that have tried to create new versions of Kickstarter, like uh, Indiegogo, Indiegogo yeah. tried. They just haven't been able to succeed with uh, board games specifically. Yeah. But um, I think you potentially get into a, a almost a segregation issue then. Where, you know, people would people would probably consider Roxley and Dice Throne a big company. They would probably consider it a big game now. So, but we don't. I mean, we, we don't have very many people. <laughs> you know, it's we're we're not a, we're we're yeah. if they if they saw our office, they'd be quite disappointed. Yes, it's not, it's not a big. <laughs> it's it literally in my garage. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Paul comes over to my garage to work. No, yeah. so. But then, if you need access to a spanner, you're fine. Yeah, <laughs> but uh so you take i mean it, it's all like I, okay so I, I ran a bunch of kickstarters years ago for comic books and i remember the first mm -hmm. one i did i raised twelve thousand dollars for my graphic novel that i made and uh afterwards mm -hmm. i had people tell me oh that's really amazing you succeeded so you're not going to use kickstarter anymore because you're no longer a small guy you made twelve thousand dollars so <laughs> You made your money. <laughs> now get out of Kickstarter and let other people make their money with Kickstarter. Because Kickstarter is for yeah. people. <laughs> you greedy who, bastard. Yes, it, Kickstarter is for I people. Just imagine you do the Dr. <laughs> Evil thing. Yes. You made $12,000. <laughs> <laughs> but I just. Pinky on the yeah, lip. I just I remember trying to explain to them that I made 12000 I made like $100. Like That's how much I took home after nine months of work to publish this independent graphic novel. And th th there's just kind of a, like right now you get to look at us and Dice Throne, and you get to say, you guys made one and a half million dollars US. And that's, <laughs> and that sounds like I really should just be out buying Maseratis and putting them on each foot and like, just like driving around town, <laughs> drinking champagne out of my shoes. Like you know? big feet. <laughs> and so, I mean, we have the reality is Manny and I and Nate just, just took money home from Dice. Yes. Room. Yeah. Yeah. Like the first time. Yes. So, so yeah. there's there's kind of a misconception, I think, that, um, but I mean, obviously, Awakened Realms, they have a ton of employees. Uh, Simon, obviously, or Come On now. They changed their way they're supposed to pronounce their company name. Um, but, you know, they're a major comp corporation, you know, they're, they're, these are, these aren't small companies. And I think the nature of any commerce or any, you know, capitalist society is that you have to, you have to compete. You have to learn how to compete. And yes. right now, I think if I was just launching Dice Throne for the first time, I don't think it would, would have been as successful. 
on Kickstarter. I think it probably might have got buried under all the other competition. I mean, when you have 50 campaigns launching every week, how do you get noticed anymore? I, I, yeah, I'm just like, you know, I ran a Kickstarter like about a year ago mm-hmm. now. Well, no, yeah, about a year ago now. And I was like, th- thank goodness it's not a game. Mm-hmm. Thank goodness it's just to kind of like help some, mm-hmm. get the show some stuff and equipment. Because I wouldn't know. I kind of, I'm like, well, I know how to market, yeah. But then it's not just a case of the marketing because I've seen games that do phenomenal amounts of marketing Mm -hmm. and they just don't seem to get anywhere. And at the other times, I see games which are kind of like, they just catch fire from absolutely nowhere Mm -hmm. and they do phenomenal amounts of money. I mean, um, I mean, Frank West, who's just finished on the Isle of Cats, I mean, he, he works his ass off, but you know, his latest one did half a million dollars. <laughs> You're just like, yep. wow, that was absolutely fantastic. But I still see the smaller guys kind of, as I say, catch fire and, and do exceptionally well. And it's just, I can't, there's not a formula. I'd like to say yeah. I know the secret of Kickstarter and what's to work. But I've seen I games think, that do really, really I mean, well. I've you, seen, you know, you know. I think it's in the in the board game industry in general because we ha- we've been out, you know, going for, you know, so many years and we're starting to establish form. There is starting to be formulas established. Right. So I think that like where, so I like to think that as long as it's innovative and presented very professionally with good branding and it's attractive, I think that it is very possible for like, if you look at dungeon drop would be a good example. I mean, out of nowhere, yep. small guy. He he knows the value of good branding and presentation. Yep. Nice, attractive video. Interesting and innovative concept for a game. Right. That's what I'm backing. Personally, I don't care about anything but innovation. So if you show me another worker, if you're just a little company showing me yet another miniatures project, sci- generic <laughs> sci-fi, generic fantasy, um, or a worker placement game, with a tiny little twist on the thousand other iterations we've already seen, I don't care. Unfortunately, yeah. if I see an innovative game, doesn't matter how big or small they are, I will, I will back yep. it. Yep. That's what I was searching for when I was at Gen Con. I wanted to find cool games. I wanted to find something neat that I could take home and play with my with my kids, my family, friends, and like I could have gone and sat at the Asmo Day booth or fantasy flight but i instead i was i was actively hunting for something fun and unique and special i i only demoed three games total the entire weekend that i was there and i ended up buying two out of the three of them because they felt special they felt unique they felt fun like i was experiencing a new way to play games what is lighting your fire then yes. i mean what is getting you kind of excited you know what is yeah. um Manny is 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 not an easy. Crew. No, <laughs> I I want to pick your tiny. I want to t- pick the tiny corners of your mind very very quickly and say, you know, what is kind of like what is kind of like turning your head. So I come from tabletop war games. I love dueling. I love fighting games. I like to. I like mm-hmm. skirmish, like where War Machine or Malifaux or you know any any like games where I'm dueling and fighting with an army or whatever. Um, yeah. And so at Gen Con, a game called Unmatched was uh, was oh, was out. Oh yes, 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 yes. And uh, I was told by people, like some people there, they were like, "Manny, you'll like this game. This thing is awesome. It's right up your alley." And so I first thought, I first thought, nah. I mean, I appreciate it because I they also thought I would like Funkoverse, which was a new game, which was a dueling game yeah. with Funko Pops. Um, but that was the one game I played there that I went, ugh, it just didn't do anything for me. But Unmatched, not only is it all the art and design is from Mondo, the company that makes movie posters and stuff, and so the graphic yeah. design was beautiful, the art was super cool, um, But they and they, they took an old game, I think it's called Star Wars Duels, with restoration games, Yes, and so they rebuilt and polished this dueling game into a beautiful very quick like games take 15 minutes uh they're flavorful and fun you know i played as medusa battling 
uh, Sinbad, and you know, I normally don't get into licensed properties like that, but it just felt right. It felt good. Every the battle was good. The combat was excellent. The packaging was great. The price was good. I mean, with a minis game, I bought everything all in with all the miniatures and all the hero variations for like, I think it was $80. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it just, it just appealed to me. Like I, I was, um, the other game that I bought at Gen Con without playing it, I just got a demo. Someone pitched it to me. It was called Dragon Scales. And it's a game from Arcane Wonders, and I'm not necessarily a fan of Arcane Wonders. I didn't really know them much as a company. Um, yeah. But it was this fascinating game where it's kind of cooperative, but like you're trying to destroy a dragon. So on the surface, you're just rolling dice, and then you attach them to abilities, and then you um, fight a dragon. But you're all villains, like you're a, a, a fallen knight and this this witch witch lady and whatever. But if anyone tries to run away, one of the win conditions is, or end game is, someone tries to run away and they leave the dungeon. So the first person to leave the dungeon ends the game. So as you're fighting, if what if you decide if Gavin's like I'm out, I'm gonna I'm gonna run for the door, all the rest of us could yeah. be like uh, no, and then we start fighting Gavin, and we want to kill him before he leaves the <laughs> leaves the dungeon. <laughs> but meanwhile, there's a dragon trying to kill us. And so, but we're all mad because the he's wussing out. Because if he leaves, the entire win condition of the game changes. Like the victory points are tallied differently. The entirety of the game changes at the end if someone flees out the dungeon. And I, I very distinctly played this one night. It was super easy to learn as well, which was handy for me. Um, but I got towards the end of the game and I wasn't winning. I was totally, my victory points were very low. And I didn't care because I was enjoying the the combat and the the kind of pulling some jerk moves on people that I enjoyed playing games with. And right at the end, there yeah. was a guy running for the running for the dungeon exit, and I gave him a boost out the door and ended the entire game. So <laughs> I helped him run away, and everyone at the table immediately stopped and looked at me as if I had just betrayed everyone. <laughs> <laughs> And <laughs> in real life, and it was so it was so enjoyable to play this, and it was only it was less than an hour to play a whole game with five people, yeah. and the components were good. It was it was a it was a fun new experience, I think, and that's it's it's kind of like when I go see a movie. I want the movie to lie to me. I want it to lie to me so good. I want to I want to feel like I'm watching <laughs> something unique and fresh and fun. Even if there is only yeah. six movies that's ever existed in the history of the world, you know, whatever. I don't care. I want that yeah. movie to lie to me and make me believe that, you know, like Dwayne the Rock Johnson and Jason Statham are best buddies in Hobbs and Shaw, you know. Like I wanna see that. I wanna film see that just so because bad. That's like <laughs> I wanna see that film. That's I just gonna be see like it. my favorite movie of the summer, I'm pretty sure. I just because the only reason is because I watched Jason Stratham quite recently in um, his Guy Ritchie kind of debut. I think it's Snatch. Oh yeah, yep. where he's been uh, Brad Pitt, and it's just like where he is now compared to where he is there. Yes. It's just completely, yes. absolutely different. Yes. Um, what about you, Gavin? Is there anything that you're that's kind of floating your boat at the moment? I know you've not got time to do anything, so maybe sitting down and contemplating your navel for five minutes is absolute luxury at the moment. But is, is there anything in the game scene that you've went, actually, yeah, I can, you know, that's my bag? Obviously in a slightly deeper voice than mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. But is there anything that so, you're... I've been, I've been talking just with, with uh, you know, uh, the designers that I work with, um, about the idea, you know, the idea of games that have multiple acts. And I've cited, so Terraforming Mars, whether you like it or you don't like it, um, mm -hmm. one th I think one thing that it does very successfully is it has three distinct acts in the game. So, like, Dominion has two acts, right? You, like, you buy the cards, and then you, you know, you, you keep buying cards, keep buying cards, and then you start cashing them out, right? That's, like, the standard euro sort of dynamic yeah um but then you have terraforming mars which has three very distinct acts like you're you're sort of starting starting to build your tableau and you know increase your economy then you're really starting to generate lots of 
lots of resources in the middle and and working to to build up the temperature on the planet and then there's then after once you once you hit these triggers the game the game just fundamentally changes into the state where people just start putting cities and stuff all over the map um so there's three for me when i play and i've only played it a handful of times but for me, the the real success of, of terraforming Mars is in in the this sort of three act um, sort of design, and so in the realm of like games with multiple acts, which I think which really interests me, um, we just recently played Jaws um, from Ravensburger, but designed by Prospero Hall, which is a pretty talented little group of uh, designers. It's very very polished. And yeah. uh, it has, it, it, you know, talking about acts, it has two acts and they literally call them acts. Act one, you're, <laughs> you are, you know, going around one player. It's a hidden movement game in the first half and you're moving around as the shark. You're moving around the board, trying to eat swimmers. The more swimmers I eat in the first half, uh, the more cards and tools I get in, in the second act, um, which is the boat scene where, you know, these, these these guys are trying to kill me as the shark and I'm popping out of the water. And there's, so there's this double guessing bluffing sort of game in the second half. But yeah. it's also this like a trashy, you know, dice rolling and trying to hit them. And then, you know, they fall in the water. It just insanely thematic, extremely tight design. Um, and just the fact that there's these two, two distinct acts and they jive so well with with the movie. It feels very innovative, very innovative. Um, yeah, so I just I loved my experience with that. I've only played it once, so I don't know if it holds up to balance or or whatever yet. But it's definitely a game that I'm going to be playing more of. I saw a lot of people say some were spreading the shark love about. A lot of people were saying how much they enjoyed playing them, um, playing Jaws when they got their when they got their. Um, their teeth into it, basically. Um, I'm very conscious of the time, gentlemen, and you know, um, but um, and as I say, we will try and get this episode out as quickly as we can. So, if people are listening along, okay, and they're going dice thrown, I have no idea. Um, what's the two minute pitch for people that have never ever played dice thrown in their lives? And I am going to. I am going to ask both of you, one after another, to give your version of the pitch <laughs> for why people should be checking out the Kickstarter as it draws to a close. Um, and I'm going to ask Manny to tell us what he <laughs> thinks. All right. <clears throat> um, if you've never played Dice Throne, Dice Throne is effectively fantasy combat Yahtzee. So you get to be a hero, battling others, and the core game is designed and built around that idea of a direct head-to-head -head duel, where Nate, a lead designer on this, has taken that, and he has allowed you now to be able to play with your friends and to go on a campaign adventure together, trying to defeat four levels of the world to take on the Mad King at the end and take away his power and remove him from the throne. That's really concise, <laughs> Gavin. For an additional, for an additional four bonus points, <laughs> can you add on to that? Why maybe they should consider back in the Kickstarter? Seeing as if I can edit this as quickly as possible and get out of the door as quickly as possible. Why? Or you can have late pillages, by the way. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we still got another twenty-four hours. Oh yeah, I guess you got to do all the editing and stuff. Not really. I don't edit. It's no point. This has all been gold so far, except for the first bit where you were <laughs> just disappointed me. Um. Anyway, why should they jump on the Kickstarter? Go, Gavin. Uh. Well. Dice Throne, so we're kickstarting two things. Dice Throne Season 1 Rerolled. Dice Throne, if you've never played Dice Throne, Dice Throne Season 1 Rerolled is absolutely the product that you should get. Um, the best dueling game I've ever played. Most accessible. Um, it's, you know, I play, like, as I said, I've played it well over 200 times. It is the most played game in my household. Um, the community, like, you just, just look at some of the quotes on our Kickstarter page. Um, the community is nothing like I've ever seen for any other game. 
uh, people are absolutely obsessed with the game um, and see huge, you know, there's a huge amount of value just in the, the core season one box. Um, you're getting eight heroes with it. Um, so yeah, as, as Manny said, it's the, the central mechanic is basically combat Yahtzee. Um, the cards add an insane amount of strategy and decision to that. All of the characters are very asymmetrical. They all have their own sort of dynamics and, and play style. Um, one of the best things about the game is the, the level of complexity of the characters, uh, is very, it ranges greatly. So, you know, I can play my, my son, my eight year old son can play the barbarian who is very, very simplistic. Um, he's kind of, and he's actually very random. And then there are other heroes that are completely balanced with the barbarian, um, such as like the artificer say, um, and the artificer is, is, it's like playing a Euro game. You're generating resources and you're mm. using those resources to build things. So it's almost like this <laughs> clash between Euro game and, and, you know, Ameritrash. Um, literally I'm playing a, you know, a Euro game character and he's playing an Ameritrash uh, style character and uh, super exciting. Like if you ever come to our booth at a con, people are screaming and yelling and cheering um, so yeah, then Dice Stone Adventure is basically our gift to the cooperative community that say, I don't want to fight my friends. Um, I want to, you know, I want to play. I just want to, I, Dice Stone interests me, but I want, I'm into co-ops. So the, the mechanics of Dice Stone lend themselves perfectly to a co-op game, which is just mind blowing. Yeah. So it's actually pretty, the, the innovation of Dice Stone Adventure is that we've actually genre bent the game into being a cooperative game when you know you so you're, you have this dueling game and now we're telling you it's also a cooperative game which is very interesting and you it it's designed to be you know quite replayable so there are certain like legacy elements but overall we you know we wanted to create an accessible um campaign uh cooperative campaign game that you can play over you know four sessions with your friends it's, it's, it, four to four to probably seven sessions with your friends um and you can once you're done you can play it again so yeah that's there you go adventure <laughs> mm -hmm. there you go that was a long elevator ride, but I appreciate yeah, I'm, it. I'm I'm like really bad at pitching games. <laughs> that's that's this is why I'm like I don't want to go to the shows. Um, just let me make them. That's always yeah. That's you know that's just do that. Um, thank you very very much for coming on the show, gentlemen. I really 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 appreciate yeah. your time. I'm delight delighted the campaign's done so well for you. Um, and actually it was only the other week there that I realised that Dice Throne was a pun, so that's just me <laughs> um, and, and uh, there you it. go but if if people want, that's true if because I'm stupid, if people want to follow you on the internet webs, where do you exist on the internet webs, Mr. Trembley? Where do we exist? I think uh, either if you're a Facebook person, our Dice Throne community is really where you want to be. Um, okay. If you're looking for being able to order a uh, product, DiceThrone.com is where people will be able mm -hmm. to add on. Uh, if someone listens to this later after the campaign, they're, they're going to be able to still join the Kickstarter through Backer Kit uh, or Pledge Manager and get in, get in on it. So. Those are probably the two key locations, I think. And what about your good self? If they've listened long tonight and they've said, ah, he sounds cool. He sounds like a hero. <laughs> where can you? Where can they find you on the exist? Well, at uh, hero, <laughs> no, hero.com no. is uh, the first location. Forward slash, <laughs> forward slash, it's just Manny. <laughs> no, um, I, don't, I don't actually have a, a website or anything like that. So. And Captain, my captain, what about you, Mr. Brown? Uh, Roxley.com yep. and obviously Roxley on Facebook and Twitter. I mean, most of our communication now goes through social media. Um, cool. So, yeah. Social media. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we'll make sure we put those in the show notes um, so we've got notes to show 
Um, if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, go to the internet web, search for We're Not Wizards. You'll find us on all the different places, worn out faces, bright and early for the daily races, and you know our blog, which is we're not wizards.blogspot.com, and our website, which is we're not wizards.com, and our Twitter, and our Instagram, and our YouTube, and our you know, we are on the back of cereal boxes and we'll probably end up on the back of milk cartons one day. <laughs> um, if you want to uh, follow us and listen to us, just check us out in any podcast catchers that have got the word pod and cast and don't have them at all, like Player yes. FM and Stitcher. If you like what you've listened to even more, tell somebody about us, which is really nice. Or jump onto Apple Podcasts and drop us a rating or a review. If you are going to be giving us a rating or a review... Don't give us ten stars, because it makes us big-headed. <laughs> but don't give us one star, because it makes us cry. Mm-hmm. Give us something in the middle, like a five, because <laughs> it's average, and we're just a little bit average. <laughs> but the people who have not been average tonight, I give you, I give you Manny. I give you, he's always been my hero, it's Mr. Gavin. There you are. Um, sure. Thank you very, my, very much for coming yep. on. Um there's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, gentlemen? No. <laughs> uh, um, Manny's a wizard. Oh, come on. <laughs> He's, you're a bit of a wizard, Manny. <laughs> and the you second see thing... Draw. I, I did finish the dial just, while we were on the, the podcast, so... See, he's doing yeah. art while we're talking. I can't even begin to process that. I'm I'm having to sit down because if I'm sitting down or standing up and talking and breathing at the same time, <laughs> my brain starts to slowly drip out of my nose. Um, yeah, so I, and <laughs> I, I had to do the dial because we're doing the Treant presentation today. So there you go. All right, there you go. There you go. And the second thing is to say goodbye. So it's, it's a goodbye from the rather wonderful, rather fantastic... Gavin Brown. Say goodbye, Gavin. Goodbye, audience. Thank you. And it's, <laughs> and goodbye, it's goodbye, Gavin. And it's a goodbye. It's a good it's a goodbye, goodbye, Gavin. Goodbye. Get out goodbye, of here. Gavin. And it's a it's a goodbye from Manny. Say goodbye, Adios. Manny. Yay! It's and it's like, a goodbye from me. It's like the end of uh in the night garden. I thought this was like the uh, this was kinda like the end of Lord of the Rings where it just keeps ending. <laughs> It just West. keeps ending forever and ever. I've still not finished. And uh, it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe, roll sixes, make something awful, and uh, get that dice thrown. Mm. Mm. But until the next time, dice goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs>